Hi, this is David. I'd like to illustrate the central limit theorem with some brief code in R. And the central limit theorem is really elegant in statistics. And I start with executing, by executing these first three lines here, which just assign values to some variables, including lambda. I'm going to assign a value of 5 to that. And that's because the underlying random variable here is going to have a Poisson distribution. I've selected that because it's definitely not a normal distribution. It has skew, but also it's efficient. It only has a single parameter, lambda. I've just defined that as 5, arbitrary. And now the size of my simulation. Here is the sample size. That's important. I've just decided that each sample is going to have, have, contain 40 random variables. So that's my n. And how many of those samples separate samples or trials am I going to run? 1,000. Again, I've just decided that. And so here's the command that executes the simulation. I only need a single command in R. It's R-P-O-I-S. The R stands for random. And this generates a random Poisson variable. I only need two arguments. The number of variables to put in that vector that are random, random, randomized by R, and then the parameter lambda for the distribution. And so if I run this, command, you'll see here, I get back a vector. It has 40,000 values in it. That's because we we asked for 40. N of 40 times rows of 1,000, 40 times 1,000 is 40,000. And so we've got a vector. And so you can see here, R generated for me a random variable here with a Poisson distribution. It's of 10. So this first one's high because the Poisson distribution is also elegant in that the lambda defines both the mean and variance of that distribution. So the expected value of this random variable is 5. So you can see our first one here is twice as high, quite a bit higher, but it's random, so that's possible. The second and third ones are 4 and 6, much closer to the expected value of our uh, random Poisson variable. Okay, so then in this command here, I'm not going to change the values. All I'm doing is shaping this vector into a matrix. Matrix, take this, take the vector I've already generated, and really stuff it into, in this case, 1,000 rows. So I execute that. You can see I've got here, M is now a matrix with 1,000 rows and 40 columns. And you can see we've got the same 40,000 random variables that we already generated. And so just to graphically show you what I've got, because it's a little easier to follow it this way. If, if we take a look here at the first row in green, that's my first sample or what I called my first trial. And that trial contains 40 random variables with a Poisson distribution. That first random variable was 10, the second one was 6. And then just imagine 3 through 39, the 40th random variable, and this is actually true, ends up is a 7 in that set. So that's my first sample. The n is 40. And then I go down here to the second line. And the second sample, or the second trial, is a totally different set of random variables, 1 through 40 in blue. So you can see now, you can imagine just going, here's 3 all the way down to the 1,000th row. So one row for each trial, each row, which is a trial or a sample, contains a sample size of 40 columns or 40 random variables. Because what I'm going to do next is just compute the sample mean for each sample. So if we look at that first row here, a four, sample size 40, it's got its own sample mean. It's just going to be the average of those 40 random Poisson variables. And then the, this sample mean here, what I've labeled x sub 2, is just the average of this set of 40. And so you can see this final column here is going to be 1,000 sample means. And then the key idea, because we're looking at the central limit theorem, the central limit theorem tells us about the distribution that we should expect of the sample means. See, it's the distribution here of this column of sample means, which is going to be slightly different sampling variation every time we run a different a new simulation. Okay, so that's what we generated. And now, as I said, my next command there is to generate that column, really, of sample means, one for each row, so I can just use that built-in row means function, and you can see it returns for me, as we expected, a vector with 1,000 values. So 4.53, the first one here, is 
the sample mean for that first trial or that first uh, row in my matrix. 4.55 is the average of that second row of 40 random variables. And so I have a thousand of those in that vector of sample means. And the central limit theorem tells us at least two things. So the first thing it tells us, I'm not plotting the histogram here, I just don't have the screen space to do it, but I plotted it separately already. The first thing the central limit theorem, theorem tells us is that the distribution of these sample means is approximately normal or converges on the normal distribution as n increases. And so I plotted this one, I just ran a histogram with no defaults and for this set, for this simulation, and you can see my histogram, while it's not exactly normal, you can see how it might approximate a normal distribution. And so that's the first thing that central limit theorem tells us. It tells us that, notice, notice that our underlying random variables had a Poisson distribution. They did not have a normal distribution. That's the magic part of it. It tells us that as long as those random variables are independent, that the distribution of the sample means will be approximately normal. And so that's a pretty cool outcome. And then it gets even better because now I'm just going to run two calculations here. I'm going to run the mean of the sample means and I'm going to run the standard deviation of the sample means and just assign those to those two those two variables right here. So the mean of the sample means, which is stored in sm.avavj, is, as we probably would expect, pretty close to 5 which was our lambda, and lambda is the expected value of our random variable. So probably not too surprised by that. We would expect it to be close to 5, but we're not surprised that it's not exactly 5 due to sampling variation. But what's really cool about the central limit theorem is that it tells us not only that the distribution of the sample means converges on normal as the sample size increases, but it tells us that the variance of that distribution of sample means should be should approximately be the population variance divided by n the sample size or in our case again lambda is the parameter we passed which is also the variance of the Poisson distribution so we have lambda divided by the size of our sample that is the expected variance, the theoretically expected variance or analytically expected variance of the distribution of sample means, which means that the square root of that is what we expect the standard deviation of the sample means to be. In other words, for this distribution that's approximately normal, it's telling us about, it's telling us about the standard deviation of this distribution. And so that's a straightforward calculation because that's just our, our 5 divided by our 40 square root that quantity. And that quantity then, the theoretical standard deviation of the distribution of sample means, you can see here is 0 0.35, 355, etc. And notice how remarkably close it is to the standard deviation of the sample means that we actually ran that we actually simulated. And as long as we ran enough, as long as our sample size is sufficiently large enough and we run enough, enough trials or samples, that's going to generally be the case. So that's that second insight in central limit theorem that ends up being pretty cool. And again, we started with an underlying distribution that's not normal, yet it exhibited these, this proper, this properties of the sample means having a normal or approximating normal distribution and also further where we could predict really what the standard deviation of that distribution of sample means is going to be. So I hope that's interesting. Thank you.